Thanks. Yes, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about these string indexing problems. Uh, yeah. Ah, there we go. All right, so I think maybe last year or a couple of years ago, uh, some of these problems were introduced. Uh, this first problem that we're going to talk about today is uh, what we call the two pattern query problem. So you're given a collection of documents and you want to index the documents such that you can answer queries given two patterns. Give me all the documents where both patterns occur. Okay. The next problem we'll look at is the excluded pattern problem, where you again have a collection of documents. You want to index these documents so that you can answer queries given a positive and a negative pattern. Uh, tell me all the documents where one occurs and the other one must not occur. So I suppose you can imagine some implications of these, these two uh, problems. Uh, the first one can be used for, say, indexing XML documents with uh, tags, comma values, or something like that. You want to find all the tags that contain certain, certain texts or something similar to that. And the second problem is something you see used in search engines from time to time. All right. So let's talk about some previous work. So in 2012, Fisher and others came up with this, uh, this solution with square root n. Oh, sorry. Did I say that? Right. The length of the total length of the documents is n. So their query time is square root n and plus k, where k is the output size. And they use quite a bit of space. And what we'll see later is that this somehow lies on an optimality curve. And in the same year, by Hahn et al., they came up with a solution running in this time. And actually, if you read the paper, they have this log log n factor as well, which you don't need. It's a predecessor structure, which you can replace by range Simpson's queries. So yeah. Anyway, the important thing is they got down to order n words. And in the same paper, you get square root and counting. Okay. And in our paper, what we show is we get this bound. And this is, again, not what it actually says in the paper. It says log n. It should say this. This is actually, if you do the careful analysis, that's what you get. And we use linear space. OK. And the important contribution, I think, is that we show that the problem is at least as hard as Boolean matrix multiplication. OK. So this will be the outline of the rest of the talk. I'll tell you shortly what Boolean matrix multiplication is, for those of you who don't know. Then I'll do a reduction to the two-pattern query problem, essentially showing that if you solve the two-pattern query problem, then you can also multiply matrices together. And finally, I'll do a, a summary. So let's get started. What is Boolean matrix multiplication? Well, you all know integer matrix multiplication, I hope. So we're given these two matrices, and from now on, it will be square root n by square root n matrices. In my case, square root n is 3. And when I multiply these two matrices together, I, I want to compute this one up here. Then I take the first row vector, and I take the first column vector, and I, I take the scalar product, and I do it like this. And using the definition, I get this formula, and it's equal to 2, so I put 2 up here. OK, great. And then, then we continue, take the next, uh, the next column vector, and multiply them together, and we get the next value up here. Great. So you continue like this, and then you get a matrix. This is the definition of matrix multiplication. You all know this. So what is Boolean matrix multiplication? Well, it's the same thing, pretty much, except now you have true-false, or 0, 1 matrices. And when you multiply matrices together, you still do the same thing, except now we will replace the multiplication by an AND, and we'll replace addition by OR. So in this case, we'll get this formula. So we'll take this one and with that one, or this one, and that one, or this one, and that one. In this case, we see this one will give us true, so we get true here. Fine. Another example, get this formula, that one, 
Nope. No. No. It'll be false, right? Great. And you continue and you get an entire matrix. Okay. So the important thing about Boolean matrix multiplication is that you essentially can view it as uh, doing a bunch of set intersection queries. So if you say that the ijth entry over here, some entry over here, it will be true if and only if there exists an index such that these are both true, right? So I think I have an example, yes. So this one is true if and only ex if there exists a column in the second, sorry, yeah, if and only if there exists a column in A where uh, the first one, sorry, the second, yeah. Right, so we're in the second row. We're in the second row, and this one will be true if and only if there exists a column of A in the second row of A, such that in the same uh, row of B, uh, the column will be true. Okay, so this is what we have here. So now you're going to make these sets instead, saying that I'll take the take each row of A and I'll make a set out of it, saying I'll take take all the indices where in the ith row it says true, and similarly for B I'll do it for columns instead. Now the ijth entry of C up here will be true if and only if their intersection is non-empty. Right, so if you do the set for this one and the set for this one, you'll see this contains one, and this one will contain one, two, and three. Great. Their intersection is not empty, it's one, which means this one, that index up there, will be true. In particular, this intersection actually computes the witnesses for why that one should be true. Okay, so why should we think that this two-pattern query problem should be hard? Uh, intuitively, let's, let's do a really bad solution. So we're going to take our uh, collection of documents, we're going to build the generalized suffix tree, and then down at every leaf, we'll write the document ID, which suffix, did this doc uh, which suffix does this correspond to in terms of document. So this is what we write down here, and then we'll get two patterns, the, and we want to report all the documents that occur here and here. So what is this essentially? If we may make them out to be sets, then what we want to compute is the intersection. So this is why intuitively this, this problem should be hard. Okay, so let's, let's try and go through the reduction. So we'll have these two square root n by square root n matrices, and what we want to do is we want to construct, based on these matrices, a set of documents. Then we want to run our indexing algorithm on, the, uh, on these documents we created, and then we want to do a bunch of queries to fill out this matrix. Okay. Right, so you should keep this in mind while you construct these documents. This is the important uh, fact that will allow us to make the reduction. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna make documents for the A matrix, and then we're gonna make documents for the B matrix. And the way uh, we do it is by looking at where does it say true in the first column of A, this will be the first document. So it says true in position one, two, and three. The next document only says true in position three, and finally, one and three. So you may have noticed that this one, before we multiplied rows from A with columns of B, and later what we'll actually do is we'll make queries where the document number will be the witness we had before. That's why we sort of transpose this. So similarly in B we'll do it by rows. And now for technical reasons, we need to index these from four because we want to distinguish between uh, a and B matrices. So, minor technicality. Don't worry too much about it. So we create these documents. And then, 
finally, we'll create the concatenation. And these will be the final documents we want to build our index on. So what did I do? We built these, all these documents, we concatenate them. Okay. This is my document set D. Now let's try and do a query. So if I want to do, find out what should it say up here, now just to check what should it actually say, it should say, okay, this one is true and that one is true, so this one should be true. So what I want for my output for the query to be is that is there a document where one occurs and four occurs? That should be true. Is that the case? It doesn't occur here, it doesn't occur here, but it occurs here. Okay, it actually occurs in document three. If you recall, we made this document by looking at this column, right? And we wrote one in here because the first one is true. And so it was the third document. So this means it's, uh, this four should occur here. It does. Uh, in document three, so it will be this row and that one in particular is what this particular character is for. So this is actually the witness saying that these two are both true. So that's how the query works. So this one is true. Let's try another example. So one and five, so this is the same example as before, it should actually be false. So the property that I'm trying to convince you of is that this reduction maintains that this one is true. So if the number i occurs in the else document, so i is between one and three in this case, then it means that uh, ai comma l is true. Right, so let's just do an example. Uh, three occurs in the third document of a, which means that this one should be true. Yes, this is exactly what our, redu our reduction guarantees. And for B, we have to add this three, technicality again. But it also maintains this property. This means exactly when I do my queries, the way I've constructed them, it will actually report exactly what I want. So we continue doing queries for all of these. And just let's do another one just for fun. Three and five. So what I'm trying to fill out now is this index, or this entry up here. So is that document where one occurs and five, or oh sorry, three occurs and five occurs? Document two, great. So this one should be true. Finally, the last index. So what I want you to notice here is that now I'm making a query for uh, this one multiplied with that one. So if if these matrices were in fact 0, 1 matrices, and I did regular integer matrix multiplication, what my answer would be would be 3, right? So actually, if you do this, the same reduction, but use regular integer matrix multiplication and so on, and you use the counting queries, then what it would say would be 3, right? Because how many documents satisfy that 3 occurs and 6 occurs? Uh, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so this reduction essentially shows that it's hard to count how many documents satisfy uh, that two different panels occur in them. Okay, so to sum up, the current best matrix multiplication algorithm runs in this time. I think this, I don't know how, how long ago, I think this is a year or two ago, something like that. Uh, and what it does is it's an algebraic algorithm, algorithm, meaning that you maybe know, maybe you know Strassen's algorithm and similar algorithms. What they use is these algebraic identities. So you can somehow find find small matrices that you can multiply together fast, and then you know do divide and conquer essentially. Okay. So what our construction actually says is, reduction says that the construction time for indexing these documents and then doing afterwards n queries, that should take the same time as matrix multiplication. So either we must use n to the 1.18 construction time, or we must use n to the 0 0.18 time per query. Okay, this doesn't really look like the bounds that we had on the first page. 
Uh, oh yeah, I should mention that. We, we lose a log factor in the reduction. It's because you need to encode numbers. What you get as input is two square root n by square root n bit matrices. You need to create documents that are in total n log n bits. So we lose that log factor somewhere. Anyway, if we continue to what is known as combinatorial algorithms, and this concept is somewhat fuzzy defined, fuzzily defined in the literature, but you can think of it as being uh, instead of uh, integer matrix multiplication, then it's uh, min and plus you have. Like, you take the minimum of the addition of all the pairs. The thing that makes this hard is that you don't really have an inverse operation to the minimum. It's not that easy to compute. So this is usually what we mean when you say combinatorial algorithms. And I just wanted to put up what that means in this case. It means either you should use n square root n, construction time, or you should use square root and query time. And also, uh, it's not really clear how it helps doing what it means doing algebraic tricks in this data structuring problem. It seems it's more of a combinatorial nature, so this is probably the right, the right bounds. And now, just to recall what Hon and Al did in 2012, they got this order in space and square root in counting, which lines up pretty nicely with these two things. And what I would also like to say is that for the reporting case, they have this, uh, or we do as well, we have this uh, query bound of square root of n times k, which I personally find really bad, <laughs> right? Because what you usually want is like square root n plus k, but we have them as a multiply multiplicative factor. So that's an open problem. Can you do that better while also remaining in linear space? All right, so that'll be my talk. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Okay, maybe just I wanted to ask, uh, the trade-off in the end, is it, uh, does it uh, is it sort of a two step? It's either square root n or n to the one and a half? The, the uh, yeah, it's, it's one or, or the other. Have, what? It's one, you need one or the other. You can make it sort of smooth that uh, if you increase the space, the time decreases. Uh, no, no, you need one or the other. One or the other, okay. But there's no reason you should have both. Okay. Right, so that's also what you saw on, if you allow me to go back to the previous work slide. It'll take a while. That's the problem with overlays, right? Here we go. So you see here, they have square root n, and they have a lot of space, which sort of suggests that you also need a lot of construction time, yep. right? But there's no reason you should have that much space and that much square root time. If you have this much space, why can't you just have order k? I mean, what you probably can't, right? But my reduction, or the reduction we just went through, doesn't say anything about that. Okay. It says you need one or the other. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank Jesper again.